Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to have Justin uh, speaking about the work they uh, presented last fall um, at the ECCV conference about the way how one can apply ideas from vector symbolic architecture for the task of image translation. And uh, without further ado, Justin, the floor is yours. So uh, happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, so yeah, as you said, I'm gonna be giving a talk basically uh, from what we presented at ECCV in the fall, uh, where we were trying to address this problem of unpaired image translation, uh, taking some inspiration from the VSA and HDC uh, literature. So in general, our team is interested in addressing uh, what's known as the domain gap. Um, so it's typically measured as the difference in performance between training on synthetic data and then evaluating on real data. Uh, and so typically what you see is that there's a kind of a performance drop when you're applying a trained model to real data, even if it has pretty good performance on that synthetic data. And we typically think about the domain gap in two different gaps. One is the content gap, which uh, we typically define as the difference in the layout, uh, kind of the position, pose, number of objects between two domains, uh, geometry of the objects, scale and relationship of the objects. And also the appearance gap, which is looking at the difference in kind of the sensors uh, between domains, the textures of objects, lighting, color, and several other things like that. And so in general, the content gap is typically pretty hard to uh, kind of bridge because we need to have access to the synthetic data rendering pipeline, and we need to have a model of the content distribution of the real data. Um, so it's a little bit harder to kind of address the content gap easily. But we actually can use uh, image to image translation methods uh, to try to bridge the appearance gap. And so kind of the typical approach here is using GAN-based methods where we train a generator network to try to translate our source images to look more like the real images while preserving the content of the uh, original images. And so this is just done as uh, many of you may be aware using discriminators where the discriminator is training to try to discriminate whether or not the images it's seeing are real or fake. So fake being generated by the generator. And then we're back propagating to the generator so that the generator can better fool the discriminator. And the problem is that when the two data sets, uh, these source and target data sets are not well matched in terms of their content, we tend to get a lot of hallucinations and artifacts like those shown here. And kind of specifically in this uh, example, we can see that it's probably due to the layout gap that is really causing these uh, hallucinations, where we can see that the difference in the distribution of the sky label and the vegetation label between our source and target domains uh, is pretty stark. And we indeed see that these regions that were uh, originally labeled sky in the source domain kind of get flipped to uh, what basically look like uh, vegetation or tree image features in the translated image. So this is typically referred to as semantic flipping. Um, and so you can see that you might this might be a problem because if we want to use image translation to then train a semantic segmentation network, well, these images no longer reflect the ground truth uh, semantic labels. And so the train network might end up predicting sky when it's uh, seeing trees or other vegetation in the images. And so in our method, we were inspired to uh, use the VSA uh, approach to try to address this and try to reformulate the problem from thinking about the image space to thinking about uh, trying to learn a mapping between source and target hypervectors. Uh, so in this case, we're kind of assuming that we can have a hypervector representation of image patches where we have shared content but domain-specific appearance in terms of the representations of those image patches between the source and target domain. And then our goal here is to try to learn this mapping that would be implicitly kind of unbinding the source uh, appearance and correspondingly binding target appearance uh, during the image translation. And then kind of conversely, if we want to go from uh, a translated uh, hypervector back to the original source hypervector, we would want to invert that mapping and unbind the target appearance and bind the source appearance. So. I'll just say that this is an implicit uh, unbinding and binding. We don't explicitly do this. It's uh, this mapping that we're learning that we're interested in. Uh, 
And so specifically, we follow the uh, Norbert et al. Uh, method and uh, extract uh, image features using a pre-trained convolutional neural network. So in this case, we used VGG19, uh, and we actually extract features from multiple layers of VGG19. And then we can concatenate those features uh, corresponding to this roughly the same image patch into kind of a very, very high dimensional uh, feature vector. And then we use uh, locality sensitive hashing to uh, project those very high dimensional vectors into kind of the lower, relatively lower dimensional hyper vectors um, that we're using in the, in the method with the dimensionality here of uh, 4096. Uh, and just want to note that these are uh, continuous hypervectors, so there's, they're in the range of negative one and one. So overall, our method is still GAN-based. So we're still using uh, a discriminator to try to um, train our generator. But in this case, we're actually working within the uh, hypervector space. Um, so for each uh, kind of iteration of training, we're taking in the source uh, image target image, and then a translated image. Uh, and we're encoding the image patches into uh, hyper vectors, as I said before, using pre-trained feature extractor and then locality sensitive hashing to get the source hyper vectors, target hyper vectors, and translated hyper vectors. And then our goal is actually to learn this uh, hyper vector mapping. So we're basically training another network that would generate a hypervector mapping to be able to go between the two domains. Um, and so when we bind this hypervector mapping with the uh, source hypervectors, we would like to have hypervectors that then are kind of in the target domain essentially. And so they should be able to fool our discriminator, which is discriminating between the, sort of the target hypervectors and translated hypervectors. And then we use that same mapping hypervector to bind with the translated hypervectors. And in this case, we're trying to get the reconstruction of the source hypervectors. And in this case, it's uh, we call it a VSA loss, but it's it's just basically the cosine distance between the source hypervectors and these translated hypervectors mapped back to the source domain. And so Feel free to uh, ask questions at any time. Uh, this might be a good moment if there's any questions about the method. Um, if not, I'll just kind of continue kind of demonstrating some of the results that we show. So in general, uh, we are trying to match the appearance of this target domain, which is cityscapes shown on the left, while preserving the content of our original domain, which is the synthetic GTA 5 uh, video game images. Uh, and here we're just kind of showing some different regions within the image where we have obviously kind of similar content, but different appearance. Uh, and so just to highlight, uh, for instance, in cityscapes data set, we typically have kind of white lane lines versus in GTA, it's typically kind of like a yellow lane line. Uh, and so you can see in our translated uh, images, we have indeed translated those to the kind of more typical white lane lines. Uh, and then the other kind of main feature that you can uh, pick up on is that the cityscapes images tend to have this kind of like more gray, smoother roads, um, whereas GTA has kind of a more cracked appearance and is typically darker. Um, and you can see, obviously, in our translated images, we have these nice smooth roads that better match the appearance of the target domain. And another thing to point out is just, uh, it might be a little bit harder to appreciate, but we tend to get better kind of uh, reflective properties on the cars as well. So a little bit more of like these highlights um, uh, in the cars that are translated, which uh, appear a little bit more photorealistic than in the original uh, GTA images. Uh, another nice kind of property that uh, just kind of falls out of this approach is that we have uh, temporal consistency across video frames as well. So we actually can apply this to video streams of uh, GTA 5 and see that we don't see any kind of artifacts or changing, uh, drastic changing of the translated images, which actually you tend to see across a lot of different um, image to image translation approaches. Um, there's just kind of uh, different, uh, very large differences, even for similar frames when using a lot of other image to image translation approaches. Uh, 
Uh, and indeed, kind of just a direct qualitative comparison with our other baseline methods demonstrates the kind of uh, artifacts and hallucinations that I've been referring to. Um, so across a lot of the other baseline comparisons, you can see that they still have this uh, semantic clipping where they're generating, uh, you know, these kind of like vegetation uh, tree uh, features in the sky. Uh, in the case of cut, sometimes it's also sort of like building like shapes. Uh, but with, interestingly, there's this other method that uh, gives qualitatively pretty good results uh, that's called enhancing photorealism enhancement. And in their case, they're actually removing trees. Um, and so kind of the idea here is perhaps that because palm trees don't exist in the cityscapes data sets, they are just trying to basically erase them from the image uh, to make it look more realistic without actually hallucinating any new images or new um, features into the image. Um, and then another thing kind of to point out here is that they actually have sort of an inappropriate lighting. Uh, they uh, have a lot of reflection on a lot of their vehicles, kind of regardless of what the lighting condition is. So you, you can see that it's a pretty dark image, and yet you have very high reflectance off of these cars. So we then also compare quantitatively, uh, obviously, with our other baseline methods. Um, so we do two different main quantitative comparisons. So the first is uh, kernel inception distance. So it is basically measuring the uh, distance of distributions of image features extracted using the inception v3 network. Uh, so here, lower numbers are better, meaning that we're better able to translate image features that match the distribution within the target domain. And then the other thing is uh, we use semantic segmentation performance of a uh, semantic segmentation network trained on cityscapes and then basically applied uh, to the synthetic uh, to the translated uh, data to try to predict the uh, classes, uh, the semantic segmentation classes for those translated images. So here, higher numbers are uh, reflecting better performance. Uh, and what's kind of interesting, I think, is being able to apply this to a lot of different image domains with very minimal changes um, to the kind of method in general. So this is a classic image to image translation data set, uh, which is just kind of the Google Maps and aerial photos. Uh, and so typically this is used as a paired data set where you would basically be training with paired examples of a Google map or an and an aerial photo. And so it's pretty easy to learn that kind of uh, translation between those paired images. Uh, and so to kind of demonstrate the uh, approach uh, that we have here and its kind of robustness to uh, content mismatch, this is actually trained using a uh, split of the data set such that it is intentionally mismatched in the content uh, where we followed another method uh, from a different paper that basically took the histogram of the RGB values of the uh, Google Maps and split them such that you have a data set that is more or less containing water, uh, and then another split that more or less does not contain water, mostly contains just the roads or land. Um, and so you can actually hopefully appreciate how difficult this uh, translation actually is, because what we're doing is we're training with these source uh, Google Maps, uh, but with the target data set being uh, aerial photos with largely without water. So there are some examples of water in these uh, in this split, um, but the majority have uh, just kind of roads and land. So it's actually pretty difficult to try to learn this translation um, and have realistic water be translated when you have very few examples of it. Uh, and so the I think the images for the real images are pretty, pretty compelling. Uh, and you can tell, obviously, that they are not exactly the same as the ground truth, because again, this is an unpaired approach. So we don't have access to the exact same image when we're training. Uh, and then we can go from the aerial photos to the Google Maps doing the same thing. Um, and so you can see that these are, uh, you know, obviously able to preserve the content and able to match the I think color pretty well, but this is a much more difficult situation because a lot of these uh, these maps contain, uh, say, like roads and paths, especially in these forest regions, 
and parks that are actually pretty hard to see even as a human with your naked eye, like kind of understanding where these paths exist. So it's a pretty challenging uh, translation in general. And hopefully it will be uh, easy to appreciate that uh, just how challenging it is when looking at the, the comparison of other methods uh, using this kind of intentionally uh, mismatched content split. So uh, most of the methods uh, do not do a very good job in general. And in fact, uh, cut and SR unit are uh, neither of which are able to even translate uh, and maintain the water feature that's in this image the way that ours is. And for the uh, translation to the Google Maps images, uh, none of them are able to preserve the water or the highway. But I really want to highlight again kind of the, the difference between um, the translation when the target image is a real image compared to when it is a uh, map image. And so we hypothesize that this is probably due to the encoding of the target images. So uh, if we're trying to translate to real images, we're using you know, pre-trained VGG. And those uh, networks and other similar networks like that are obviously trained on large image databases. But in terms of trying to translate to these kind of just color Google, uh, Google Maps photos, uh, it's a lot harder because the representation is probably just not as good when we're using these pre-trained VGG features rather than, say, some sort of uh, feature encoding that would be more suited towards uh, Google Maps photos. Uh, so we think that it could be improved if we could uh, either train some sort of encoding network on uh, Google Maps photos or have some sort of uh, better suited encoding method. So finally, I just want to show uh, some of the ablations to kind of demonstrate, uh, you know, what we think is important in this method. Um, so kind of the first thing we do is we just ablate the VSA loss altogether. So this is just the cosine distance uh, reconstruction loss between the uh, translated hypervectors being mapped back to the source domain uh, with those uh, source hypervectors. And so you can see that if we don't use this loss, we get a lot of artifacts and hallucinations. Uh, specifically trees in the sky again, um, but also here on the side, what look like maybe like car features or something. Um, and the Mercedes-Benz hood ornament, which if you have seen any other image to image translation methods, a lot of times this will be hallucinated onto the hood of the car, which may or may not be a bad thing. Uh, but in terms of semantic segmentation, it's pixels that are now uh, you know, basically taking up space which would otherwise be considered road. Uh, when we ablate the uh, random hypervector mapping, so basically not using, uh, basically replacing our network, which generates this uh, mapping hypervector with just a random hypervector, we get a lot of uh, hallucinations as well. Again, trees in the sky, um, hood ornaments, uh, and also there's a kind of a weird flipping that goes on with this mountain region where it basically starts to look like it might have maybe some building features or something. Um, and then finally, I think it's important to uh, demonstrate that the hypervector dimensionality is really important as well. So if we kind of reduce this dimensionality well below say a thousand, we start to get a uh, much poorer performance and it doesn't even seem that the uh, network is able, even able to learn this kind of mapping between the source and target domains. You can see how similar uh, in general the images, the translated images with the original GTA image. But we also see this kind of weird noisy um, effect in the translations as well compared to, for instance, the full model where we have, again, smooth road, white lanes, uh, white lane lines, um, and kind of better reflections on cars and this kind of more gray uh, hood of the car, uh, of the ego vehicle, which is uh, more typical of cityscapes. <clears throat> and so one kind of thing that I don't think was addressed, uh, or I know was not addressed in the paper is we were interested 
kind of shortly after uh, our presentation at ECC, trying to extend this to uh, higher resolution images, because one of the things we were kind of concerned about was if we're working with hyper vectors of very high dimensionality and we have to backprop through uh, you know, these uh, pre-trained uh, VGG networks, then it can kind of grow a pretty large memory uh, footprint on the GPU. And so here we are trying to figure out what would be the best way to kind of extend this to higher resolution without necessarily incurring larger uh, GPU memory. So here, what we did was we basically just extended the image patch. So in our kind of original paper, we used, I think, like a, a effectively a 16 by 16 uh, pixel image patch uh, of the images, which were 256 by, two, uh, 256 by 512 images. Um, but here, we could actually extend this to 1024 by 1024 just by increasing that image patch. So basically, our hyper vectors are now corresponding to larger regions of the image. But we still have pretty good uh, translations, uh, still getting that nice smooth and gray road, uh, still seeing the reflections on the cars that seem a little bit more realistic and generally matching the target uh, domain. So we've been pretty happy with how this method can be pretty easily modified for a lot of different scenarios um, and can also potentially be used uh, for very high resolution images as we, as we need to. So just as a summary, we uh, introduced this method uh, via CIT, which is able to minimize the appearance gap while uh, holding the content gap constant. Uh, and it's a pretty general method that works well across different image domains. Um, and we're able to easily modify it uh, in terms of the hyper vector encoding, not only by um, kind of changing the patch size as I just described, but also we can simply change out the feature extractor obviously so instead of using pre-trained VGG, we can use a ResNet network, or we can use a network that's maybe trained on some specific task uh, and use the features extracted from that instead. Um, but as I talked about with relation to the um, Google Maps images, it's pretty important to consider the target domain when we're choosing the hypervector encoding for this. Um, and so we probably need some uh, further research to kind of understand how best to either select that or have a method that can automatically be trained to um, optimize that for the target domain. Thanks. Yes, thanks for the presentation, Justin. Uh, why don't we start with questions? I, I have a few, but I think if uh, anyone else would like to start, please go ahead. I, I could perhaps start with the, with the first question. And, and that's uh, related, Justin, to, to this uh, exact, like to the domains to which um, the image can be translated. So you mentioned that, for example, it didn't work well on the, on the case of maps when you were doing it with Google Maps. And so I, I was thinking is like, how, how sort of wild could be that translation and what affects it? Is it kind of the absolute difference that you go from very different, from very, from one domain to sort of very different style of domain, or was it primarily because you don't have a good feature extractor? I mean, I understand that there is probably no correct answer to it, but what, what, were, what were your observations? Yeah, I think we've hypothesized that there's probably two different things going on. One is, as I mentioned before, you know, when we don't have a very good uh, feature extractor where, for instance, um, you know, as we're going through the layers of VGG, for instance, um, it's possible that we're starting to kind of lose signal with these images that aren't well suited to um, these pre-trained networks, uh, sort of kind of out of the distribution of what they've been trained on. And so kind of the later layers might actually be less meaningful. And actually, if I remember correctly, in this method, we ended up selecting earlier layers and kind of changing the configuration of the feature selection so that we would better be able to get um, kind of the most information in these uh, hyper vectors. So that's one thing. The other thing is that I think uh, when we're going from kind of very uh, kind of dense uh, features to uh, like kind of a, in terms of spatial, dis uh, like kind of the spatial distribution of features, uh, you know, kind of these dense features, 
to very kind of like sparse color regions, essentially. You're basically having to like remove information uh, from these source images. Um, and so I think that can just end up being kind of crude, essentially, for lack of a more technical word. Um, so you end up with, you know, either being all kind of green or kind of noisier uh, representations. So if you really zoom in on some of these images, they look not so great. They're not very clean. And so I think that's attributable to just kind of having to essentially go from a lot of uh, dense spatial information to very sparse. So it's in a way, it's not only like translating the style, but in some sense also a course and in sort of, you have to be able to course in the, the image as well. And I think just to follow up on that, this is a kind of a topic of interest for us in general is that like, we talk about content and appearance, but a lot of times those things are kind of intermixed and not easily separable. Hi, thanks, Justin. Um, can I speak about uh, the locality sensitive hashing for a bit? Um, sure. The, um, I'm presuming you're doing that uh, just as a, a convenient uh, dimensionality reduction uh, process, just to, to get the, the vector dimensionality down to something that's a bit more manageable. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if there's anything specific about the the LSH. So um, um, yeah, I'm just considering sort of using that versus uh, you know, something like uh, just a, a projection matrix to project it down into a lower dimensionality. I mean, I, I know very little about LSH, but I'm presuming that there are some non-linearities or, or, or product uh, terms uh, in there. And I'm just wondering um, whether, I mean, I presume, uh, that, that really all you're relying on is maintaining the uh, the cosine angle relationships approximately between the input and the output domains and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether something like an LSH uh, might introduce some weird effects somewhere along the way that perhaps using a, a straight projection um, uh, matrix might in some sense just shrink the dimensionality whereas um, LSH perhaps maintains a local relationship things together which which wouldn't normally be brought together. I don't know. So so just wondering whether you've done any work with uh, exploring what properties you know that using the LSH might introduce or not introduce over and above the obvious reason of of just reducing the dimensionality. Yeah. Just to clarify, um, kind of following the Narbert et al. paper, the LSH is really just a is just random uh, random matrix projection using okay. normalized uh, vectors essentially. So we're normalizing the uh, concatenated feature vector, and then we're normalizing each of these randomly sampled vectors of the projection matrix. Uh, and so basically, we're taking the cosine the cosine similarity between our very high dimensional feature vector in each of these uh, rows within our random projection matrix. Right, so, so you've, you've basically used LSH more as a label to explain what it's doing for the particular target audience rather yeah. than... Yeah. Okay, gotcha, yeah. thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. But it does bring up a... So actually uh, kind of an interesting aside related to the method though, I think is that the way we actually do it is we use uh, convolutional neural networks um, rather than actually flattening out uh, vectors and um, you know doing very very large random matrices. Uh, but it gives us flexibility because then we can use convolutional uh, you know layers essentially to try to select features. So we can do things like dilation, we can change the image patch size, things like that, as I kind of alluded to before. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in kind of how we want to be able to. Uh, basically take these uh, image features from uh, the PGG network and then get a uh, hypervector um, from that. Yeah, I, I did wonder the, um, I mean, because I, I presumed with the label LSH that it was essentially a, you know, a, a fixed 
uh, not data adaptive method, but you, I guess you could imagine that uh, uh, maybe there'd be some value in having a dimensionality reduction that perhaps um, preserves the, the distances of features you're interested in rather than you know, distances associated with uh, some arbitrary other noise signal in the, in the data. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. So I think one kind of uh, problem that uh, I've noticed in some of the image translations is that uh, I don't have any examples here, but uh, basically sometimes this, this kind of cracked region of the road, uh, the texture of it can look a little too similar to kind of like vegetation or grass. And so occasionally we'll get kind of like this green color added to the road right in front of the car um, where I'm not exactly sure what's going on there other than there's probably some sort of textural similarity to other uh, features um, that are being confused. And so having some sort of encoding method that is more aware essentially to you know, what you're interested in uh, in terms of being able to have uh, less clashing with um, you know, these types of textures that are similar between the uh, source and target domains. Thank you. Talking about the technical part, Justin, I was curious, what kind, what operation do you use to implement binding? Is it just component-wise multiplication or some other operation? Yeah, we just use the um, kind of the map approach. The, so it's element-wise multiplication. Element-wise multiplication. Because I was, I was like, curious about the exact binding operation because because in some situations where where I was working with sort of free of valued vectors were sort of that that were that were sort of train weights of the network. So in, in this situation, I found that circular convolution was was working better. I mean, it's of course introduces more complexity, but it was working better. And I I think my intuition why it was working better was because it it was it it basically had less, like the, the average variance when, and like in my case, the task was to sort of reconstruct the original weights. So in some sense, you kind of use binding to, to compress things and then you try to decompress things and both, both Hadamard product and circular convolution, the mean value when you would do the reconstruction, they were the same, but but because sort of circular convolution is kind of a spreading operation, the variance of the reconstruction was less. And so I was curious if, if that might be relevant for this scenario, if, if this could give any advantage. It, it could probably only be the case, I guess, in terms of, let's say, the dimensionality that is needed for the approach, for the approach to work, something like that. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. We haven't uh, spent a lot of time, obviously, um, thinking about changing the method too much, but I think it's certainly something to explore in addition to a lot of other um, ideas around uh, improving the encoding uh, to the hypervectors. And when it comes to this encoding, do you primarily think in terms of like some other sort of trainable methods like kind of trying networks from from other architectures like ResNet or something like that or uh, do you see like in this scenario a place for some sort of standard feature extraction methods like from the standard sort of from the computer vision literature um so I guess, let me understand the question. Is the question, uh, have we explored other ideas around feature extraction and maybe learning that uh, versus using kind of the standard uh, pre-trained models or was there a more specific question? Yeah, it was a very generic question. I, I, was, I was more curious about your thoughts on like, if you would, about, if you would try to, to, to address this encoding challenge, like how, what do you think yeah. are the most promising ways to do? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different considerations. Um, and so one thing that we have done just because it's pretty easy is we've tried different uh, pre-trained 
uh, networks like ResNet, like BGG, Inception, a few others. Um, and so qualitatively, if what we care about is just making the images look more like uh, the target domain, we've found that BGG works really, really well. The features from BGG in terms of real images uh, works really well. Interestingly, what we found is that when we use ResNet, the image feature, the images themselves do not look good at all when they're generated. But actually, if we train a network that also used network uh, used ResNet as its backbone, the performance, uh, the task performance is actually much better using those images, even though they don't look photorealistic or anything like that. So it's it's been an interesting topic for us to kind of understand how important photorealism is is in general for something like domain adaptation. So I would say that's kind of the the majority of what our focus has been in terms of trying to improve this method uh, with the uh, with respect to the feature extractors. In terms of trying to train an encoding uh, method, uh, I think we've played around a little bit with like starting out with VGG feature ex uh, you know extracting features, but let VGG be trainable and then have some sort of loss that would just kind of uh, modify VGG weights. Uh, the problem, obviously, if, if you just let VGG be trainable in this method without really any other restrictions, is that obviously you're going to get to a point where it's basically just going to uh, output uh, sort of nonsense so that the generated translated features are similar to the target, but it's just because the VGG feature extraction is no longer doing anything meaningful. Yeah, cool. That, that sounds great. Thanks. Do you have any other questions from the audience? Well, I guess if not, we can probably wrap up for today and the only thing uh, before uh, concluding the seminar, I just wanted to, to make quick to, to make a quick announcement that since uh, Justin's webinar was it, it was essentially a week later than than the, than than it would be normally scheduled. So the next webinar is is already next Monday, and it will be given by uh, Tayana Rosen from uh, University of California at San Diego. Uh, and with that, uh, Justin, thanks thanks again for the great uh, seminar. It was uh, cool to see these results, and it's impressive to see how you managed to sort of um, rethink the ideas from vector symbolic architectures and and you know turn turn them and, and integrate them into the cost function. As, as I mentioned before, we started the seminar. I, I think I've never seen that before, and it's. Uh, Definitely enlightening to see such, such kind of applications and, and the usage of vector symbolic architectures. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's I'm very excited uh, about this stuff, and I, I really hope that we can uh, kind of continue this direction in the future with some further research. <laughs>